Good morning. A welcome at my presentation. My name is Bartha Romani, and I'm Emeritus Professor at Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands, in the Department of Biomedical Engineering. First of all, I'd like to thank Professor Kostin for inviting me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Second, I must apologize for not presenting my lecture here in person. A severe hernia prevents my travel. I do have a long-standing relation with Bucharest. As co-organizer at the SSIMA Summer School, it's a series, together with Dr. Elena Ovreu and Professor Freddy Brookstein. I will talk today about retinal image analysis, in particular for diabetes screening. I will report on a large project that we have carried out over the last years. But how is retinal image analysis, the retinal image analysis related to diabetes? This movie gives a explanation. Diabetic eye disease refers to a group of eye problems that can occur as a result of diabetes. Without diagnosis and treatment, diabetic eye disease can cause severe vision loss or even blindness. Diabetic retinopathy is the most common diabetic eye disease and is a leading cause of blindness in persons with diabetes. It is caused by changes in the blood vessels of the retina. The retina is the light-sensitive tissue at the back of the eye. A healthy retina is necessary for good vision. In some people with diabetic retinopathy, blood vessels of the retina may swell and leak fluid or blood. In other people with diabetes, abnormal new blood vessels grow on the surface of the retina. At first, diabetic retinopathy may not cause any changes in vision, but over time, diabetic retinopathy can get worse. At first, a person might see spots floating in their vision or may notice a general blurring of vision. Eventually, diabetic retinopathy may cause vision loss and even blindness. It is in particular in Asia that diabetes is exploding. For example, in China, 11.6% of the population has diabetes, and many don't know. And that is why we were asked by a large group of ophthalmologists, a group of hospitals in China, to set up a large screening program and help them with writing software to do the analysis of the many retinal images that they were uh, aiming to acquire. The project was called Retina Check. And this increase is staggering. In 1980, there was hardly any diabetes. And in 2013, when we started our project, it was 11.6%. And this linear increase is not yet leveling off. So how do we measure this early signs of diabetes? With diabetes, your blood vessels start to leak. And diabetes is therefore a leading cause of new blindness. So if you can prevent this, that can lead to huge cost savings. Finally, 4% of the people will really get blind if you don't take sufficient measures. So we, it was decided to set up a screening program for the elder half of a population of a, a province in China, Liaoning province in the Northeast. 24 million people. And of course, that is such a staggering number that there were not enough doctors, so there was a need for computer-aided diagnosis. And this system should give a binary uh, decision, either you're safe uh, or please see an ophthalmologist. And because your blood vessels start to leak, it gives all kinds of signs on the retina. This is a picture where you don't need any computer uh, uh, analysis, but mostly the images are very subtle, and you can take these images with a regular fundus camera. So we started the project called the Retina, the Retina Check Screening Project, and we had many partners that participated. Eindhoven University uh, was developing the software. Uh, we had a, a sister school in Shenyang. Shenyang, you see the city here to the right, is in the upper north of China. It's the capital of Liaoning province. And Gushe Eye Care System was our ophthalmological partner with a large series of uh, ophthalmology hospitals. We had NuSoft, medical imaging company in China. 
We did our clinical evaluation in the largest hospital in Xinjiang, 3,000 beds. We collaborated with a company, iOptics, that supplied uh, laser scanning uh, 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 retinal cameras. And we collaborated with Maastricht University, who were very, uh, uh, who did a very uh, large diabetes uh, screening project. What is a fundus image? Well, the fundus is the back of the retina. And of course, there's no light coming from the retina. So you have a flash that uh, flashes into the light. And with a high resolution camera, you can make uh, images up to 20 megapixels. Today, there are two types, laser scan systems and a uh, regular optical system. We use both. The retina has, of course, a lot of uh, details. The fovea with the macula in the center, the optic nerve where the veins come in and the arteries and where the nerves leave the, uh, for the optic nerve and the many blood vessels. It turns out that it's really cheap to make these images. That was the reason why we went doing it with uh, retinal images. It's easy to acquire. These cameras are all over the place. We have them in ophthalmology stores, in hospitals, even with general practitioners at a very high resolution. A retina is brain tissue. It's quite special. It has a, uh, the same structure as uh, the vessels in the brain. That means with a blood-brain barrier. So diabetic retinopathy, that means what all kind of uh, uh, irregularities that you get due to diabetes on the retina, they can be very different size, mostly related to vessels because they leak and you get all kinds of deposits, microbleeds. Uh, when these deposits uh, grow, you can get cotton bolt spots, exudates, but also changes in the optic disc, changes in the vessels, uh, curvature or tortuosity changes. And all these properties, we started to develop software for that and to measure these on these images. Because quantification, that was crucial. Can we really see in a very early stage what happens with these vessels? Well, here we see a normal fundus. You see the uh, quite uh, intricate vessel detail. And this is a diabetic retinopathy fundus. And you see all kinds of small deposits. And how can you quantify uh, the number, the area of this, and the type, texture of these deposits? So we started, and in those days it was actually relatively pioneering. So we had to set up a couple of uh, yeah, basic things. What are really the important parameters? So we needed input, of course, from ophthalmologists. How to set up a screening study in China? Not easy. We were in the Northeast and hardly anyone spoke English. So we had language and culture differences. We had to collect a lot of data. How can we do a clinical evaluation and a validation? And how can we interpret the findings? So we said, let's do first a set of good computer vision quantifications, and then we go to deep learning. Deep learning is quite often a black box, and we really want to understand what is this deep learning giving us? Can we understand it in, in computer vision terminology? So we started a lot of projects, first to track the vessels, to detect microaneurysms, to study properties of these vessels, like how curved are they, what is the filling degree, how much is uh, the vessel tree taking space on the retina. If vessels are normal and healthy, they often take a 90 degree uh, uh, branch to bring the blood as fast as possible to the target. But if they get weaker, you see all kinds of other angles. Can we use these angles? Can we use these crossings for uh, landmarks to do stitching and make panorama images? Can we do this pro properly for the arteries and for the veins? So how can we separate them? A lot of different projects. So this is the layout. We start with a retinal input image. We measure all kinds of properties from the vasculature, the background tissue, the optic nerve head. And then we quantify them in specific computer vision programs to find what is the statistics of the bifurcation, etc. 
And finally, we did deep learning and the severity grading we decided to do in four grades, healthy, R1, R2, and R3. Uh, and R3 is then the most serious, where you have uh, irreversible damage to the retina. We needed money, we needed contracts, and we were very uh, fortunate to get good funding from all kinds of sources, from our scientific uh, Dutch organization from China, from the European Diabetes Foundation, and the Marie Curie program, and you see me signing the project with uh, the minister, Bursamaka, standing behind us, and to the right we had a meeting in Beijing, where we had also the minister of uh, healthcare, and uh, this was all a good start with uh, good financial support from, and from the government. To start the clinical preparation, of a collaboration, you need, of course, to do a lot of uh, good work with the people who have to do the acquisitions, who have the uh, inpatient uh, clinical uh, diabetes patients. I had PhD students, both in Eindhoven and in Shenyang, and we had a really nice team formation in both sides. Eindhoven was the software development, and Xinjiang was the clinical evaluation uh, environment. In Xinjiang, we were happy to set up a nice uh, acquisition room in the middle of the diabetes department, where we could scan all the in-house patients. We scanned finally more than 6,000 6, uh, in-house diabetes patients. You see that on the walls we had some Dutch tulips and the Chinese and Dutch flags, and the patients were really willing to collaborate with us. We also had uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, stores in 50 optometry stores. Uh, we had cameras uh, doing the acquisition. So if people came for a pair of glasses, they asked, uh, well, can we also take a picture for, your di for a diabetes screening? And people uh, really uh, collaborated in this. So finally, we went to, we went to uh, establish the relation between 17 image biomarkers and 15 metadata. And with metadata, we mean uh, we have all kinds of other information from the patient, uh, the medicine use, uh, how long the duration of the disease, uh, but also lifestyle measurements, how much do you drink, how much do you smoke, what is your age, what is your weight, etc. So we did a lot of... Uh, correlation studies in this. The full pipeline was quite complicated and you see here all the different measurements and stages that we did uh, with, with the different uh, images and I go show you a couple of these results that we did with our computer vision technique. First you need to make the image homogeneous because you have images that are uh, at some places not so well illuminated and other more so you remove inhomogeneous lighting. Second, because we work with laser light and you don't want to damage the retina, so this is very dim laser light, in fact, and this leads to noisy images, but you can very nicely clean the images and remove the noise. We did this with a nonlinear, what's called orientation score transform. It, in fact, elongated rotating, in, uh, rotating filters. We did image deblurring to make them as sharp as possible. We collaborated with Tel Aviv University, and this is a blind convolution technique. And now you can even see the uh, tiny patterns of the uh, uh, nerve fibers that go to the optic disc in this uh, uh, sharpened image. We established the artist's arterial venous ratio. There's a slight difference in color because uh, Oxygenated hemoglobin is lighter than disoxyhemoglobin, and this tiny color differences uh, gave us the separation between arteries and veins. And here you see the result. It turns out that arteries are much stronger, and veins are weaker, and the veins are more susceptible for uh, early signs and changes, like uh, getting sloppy, getting more curved. So we focused more on the veins. 
detecting of crossings and bifurcation, that was actually relatively easy. We, in every pixel, we uh, looked at uh, uh, a rotating filter, and if a filter was on a bifurcation, we got three peaks, and if a filter was on a crossing, we got four peaks, and that was a nice way to measure all these uh, bifurcations and crossings. If you have all of them, you can use them in, uh, yeah, as landmarks, key points in the image, and this means if you want to have a large area, you need to measure images where the patient looks left, right, up, and uh, down, and then finally you can stitch these images. So with nine images, you can have a much larger view, and the perspective, the, the uh, transformations to uh, make these images uh, together could be easily done from this large set of landmarks. Here we have a fully automatic, we developed a fully automatic microaneurysm detection. Microaneurysm is a very small thickening of the vessel, and it can be seen as a very tiny dot. And to the right you see the detection of these dots and the intensity of the green circle indicates the probability with which we could find these small microaneurysms. These are the very early signs of diabetic retinopathy. If this happens, you're in trouble and you need to see a doctor, change your lifestyle and uh, take further measures. If you have blood vessels, it's difficult to look behind the blood vessels, but we have a technique uh, that is uh, called in-painting, and you can remove the blood vessels, and now the blood vessels are not filled in with some blank, but they are filled in by the texture behind it, and it turns out that to find uh, these, uh, let's say, textural patterns uh, and microaneurysms is much easier with the vessels removed. So we could do this very nicely with this in-painting technique. We have these oriented filters, and they could lead us to uh, uh, yeah, filters that, if you look at the tangential structure, that means radiating away it was easy to find and enhance the vessels. And if you take the radial structures, that means concentric circles, it was very nice to find the optic disc. So we had 100% optic disc finding. And optic disc and fovea, they form the, uh, yeah, let's say the, the uh, orientation points on the retina where are your coordinates starting. Of course, we had different cameras. Uh, different shops, different hospitals, different uh, areas where we took them. And we compared six different fundus cameras to all our quantified uh, uh, computer vision techniques. And it turns out that the results were very similar. Finally, we decided to take the uh, iOptics uh, EasyScan camera. It's a laser scan. It was low cost and at uh, sufficient quality to do all, all the scanning. Vessel tracking gave particular ch uh, challenges. Here you see an example where uh, the system is following the vessel, but it comes very close to a parallel vessel. And of course, you have to be careful that you don't see a thicker vessel suddenly. But we managed to do a proper continuation of uh, uh, our oriented filters, and we could nicely see the tracking, no matter if there were vessels parallel or crossing. And if you measure the vessel width, you have to be very precise. And because we have a high resolution, 20 megapixel, we could measure precisely. And here you see uh, measurements, micrometer uh, accurate of the blood vessels in this particular retina. We did this with an active contouring technique. Uh, we let the computer find a piece of vessel, find the edges, and then the contour around this is uh, constricted with an active contour program, and then finally, it could nicely measure the uh, uh, diameter of this vessel. Blood vessel segmentation can be done in a soft way and after pressuring in a hard way, a hard vessel segmentation. And what turned out to be a very important property was uh, tortuosity, curvature. Here we see a normal, healthy retina, and most of the vessels are straight. They go directly to their target. And here we see a diseased retina with uh, sloppy curved vessels. And we managed to measure in every pixel the curvature. 
So we got a whole bunch of curvature measurements. We got images like this. And you see that blue is, uh, is straight, that means the curvature is zero. And you could have curvatures positive, that means they are convex. And you have curvatures negative, that means they are concave. So we have a whole set of uh, curvature points. We measure the statistics in the histogram. And if you look at the uh, statistics, uh, the mean of these curvatures, we see here a, a plot. This was done on uh, 1200 images from the Messidor database. Healthy has a low curvature, that means they're more or less straight, and diabetic retinopathy had a much higher curvature. And this turned out to be one of the very sensitive measures uh, to measure early uh, the, the progression of diabetic retinopathy. As I said, we had the clinical validation in Xinjiang, 6,000 in-house patients. But we also had patients from the Maastricht study in the Netherlands, which is the world's largest multidisciplinary population study to diabetes. They look at 10,000 people, 8,000 normals and 2,000 diabetes, and they get a full investigation, um, including a ophthalmology study, but also MRI scans, even bone densitometry scans, uh, lots of it. And they come for one and a half day, are fully investigated. And we had full access to the ophthalmology data uh, to this uh, diabetes cross correlation study that was really fantastic. And in Xinjiang, we had, of course, uh, the patients had to sign a form for an informed consent, and we had to connect to the hospital information system to measure all the other data from the from the patient. It was all in Chinese, but my PhD students they did a really good job to get this done. Uh, we published quite a number of papers. You see some papers on uh, tortuosity, and it was really vascular tortuosity that was uh, uh, a really uh, significant sign for detecting early, early diabetes. We made the retina check workstation, and this was done for the doctors who measured all these uh, properties to the images, and they found this uh, really ver that it was very versatile, and they could now see when the image was done, that the software could measure uh, and display for them all the proper statistics, what happens with this particular retina, how many of these uh, uh, cotton wool spots, etc., how many can we see, uh, the landmark detection, the particular pieces of branches, uh, we could nicely measure the uh, uh, set of, uh, you see the, the very gray uh, areas here for the uh, cotton ball spots. We had the arteries and vein detection. We could measure the curvature and all it was in display available for them in quantitative sense. Here we have it specifically for arteries and veins. And then we got, of course, deep learning and everybody today talks about deep learning. And it was really good to start the deep learning area after having such a good experience with computer vision. And why is it called deep? Well, deep neural networks has many layers. So you have layer where the input, and then you go all the way progressing. And you see what these layers do is in the first layer, they have a very simple detection of just edges and lines. If you want to detect more complicated things, for example, for a nose, you need already three lines. You combine them and you get these uh, combinations of parts. Combining those, you get faces, etc. So deeper, you get more contextual uh, use of the analysis of structure. This is very much reminding like the visual uh, system, who also exploits multiple layers. We have here V1, V2, V3, V4, and we have lots of layers that do the same deep contextual analysis as in our artificial neural networks. And what we need, of course, is uh, lots of data, the clever network architecture. We learn the system by error propagation, so we feed it with uh, a lot of uh, uh, known data, and we need good classifiers. Well, the neural net is because it is very resembling a real neuron, so we have these synapses that are connecting to a neuron, and as you know, 
if you learn something, the synapses physically grow. If you have a, a connection that's used a lot, you play piano a lot, then you, you grow your synapses. If you forget, they shrink, and if you really forget, they disappear. Well, a neuron adds all these uh, synapses together, and in a neural network, these synapses are modeled with weights. Well, you sign them all up in the soma, in the, uh, uh, in the cell body, there is a threshold, and if the voltage comes above a certain threshold, you get an action potential. Well, all this is modeled in an artificial neuron as well. We used to have three layers in the network, but those were not so good. It was only 75%. And now we have much deeper networks. This is a very early, and this was uh, in 2012, the network that gave a big success where everybody jumped on it and said, wow, this is uh, doing a major thing because a major challenge uh, that, that, that was a game in, in finding in 1.4 million images, 1,000 classes, who is the best? It was always around 75%, and today it is 94% exploiting these deep neural networks. The trick is you do, it's, it's called a convolutional neural network. You put in the images to the left and they're all processed to the end. And at the end you get an error, but you can adjust the error and that's called error backpropagation. And adjust all the weights until the output is right. You have minimized the error. Well, if you do this thousands of times, or sometimes even millions of times, you get a network that has the proper weights and that has learned, it has been trained. Today's networks may have hundreds of millions of connections, so we need a lot of data to train them. And the lucky thing with retinal images is that we have a lot of data. So it was also the reason that Google, when they started in medical imaging, they first started looking at retinal images because they were available in the thousands, even in the hundred thousands. We employed deep residual networks. Residual networks have a feedback loop and not they compare a process loop with the original, and you have many a concatenation of all these different networks. And this network turned out to, uh, it was even possible to uh, uh, do a fully automatic exudate detection in a way that we didn't have to indicate all the particular pixels. This pixel is an exudate and this is a normal background. Now we could just indicate something is wrong on this particular retinal image, and then it gives us the proper uh, pixel-wise output. And here you see image-based in, pixel-based out, and it was a really uh, uh, well-performing network. If we looked at the performance, uh, we did this on many public uh, databases, uh, EOFTA, DR2, Diabet, uh, uh, Diabet DB1, and you see that the performance of the network was uh, really high. We could even learn uh, the system to uh, uh, give us what are the areas where curvature is high. And that was quite nice. So learning the network uh, to visualize the uh, curved uh, blood vessels was, was a nice finding for our uh, neural networks. Kaggle has many challenges. <coughs> and in 2015, there was a Diabetic retinopathy detection challenge. There was uh, quite a number of uh, people, that, uh, that quite a number of teams, 661 teams, uh, with a prize of uh, $100,000. We participated too. Uh, we ended up uh, at place 17, which is uh, well, quite nice. It's in the top uh, 3% of the, uh, all the participating teams. After all our software engineering, uh, writing publications, etc., we managed to get a nice set of uh, uh, tools to do the real screening, uh, set of screening program. We managed uh, to get 28,000 persons uh, for our training, the neural networks, and for our uh, clinical study. It was all coupled to a telemedicine system of Ge uh, Eye Hospital. Uh, we had in the vision stores uh, the different acquisitions. There was even a WeChat app developed so 
the patient could see uh, their own retina and the first indication of what uh, the feedback was uh, from the system. And we are in what is currently in development is that you can mount a dedicated camera to a smartphone uh, which has a flash concentric to the, uh, uh, to the lens. Normally in a smartphone the, uh, the flash is, is uh, outside of the, the camera, so not, not really suitable. This is in development. And we wrote a lot of publications, more than 50. Uh, I'm very proud of my uh, collaborators, my PhD students, uh, both in China and in uh, Eindhoven. And finally, this Retina Check project was converted in a TUE startup in 2017 and fully acquired by the Ge Vision Group in Xinjiang. And they are rolling it out in Chinese, in Liaoning, and develop the software very further. My PhD students have finished, I retired, and it was very nice to see that this program that uh, took us a lot of effort landed in a real clinical uh, rollout. So I end here with an acknowledgement to the very nice partners that we collaborate with for so many years. It was a fascinating journey. Uh, it was uh, uh, many supports uh, from uh, China and from the Netherlands. And I'm especially, uh, uh, yeah, so many patients that we could help with this study, with the different properties, curvatures, microaneurysms. Uh, the patients in the clinic, the hundreds that we studied in the hospital. It was all part of a program, Vision for Vision, in which we have uh, the right to sites. So thanks to all members of the Retina team, and thanks for you for listening, and I'm open for questions. Thank you very much.